My name is Dr. Mitchell Joachim. I'm an architect and urban designer here in Brooklyn, New York. I am the co-founder of Terraform One. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization that is working to think about the near socio-ecological future of cities. And I'm going to show some of the work that we have been doing over the years. And I am very excited to open up this uh, presentation right now. So here we have um, an example of our first publication. This is called Design with Life. It is essentially a look at uh, the work that we have been doing over the past uh, 16, 17 years and gives a detailed explanation of everything that we have been up to. And I think that if you want to know more, this would be a great thing to check out. Our motto is design against extinction. This is really what we see as the big problem. Biodiversity loss in cities is a major issue. And our clients, patrons, commissioners, the people that we work with, uh, in many cases, allow us to work with, or we choose to work with organisms that don't have a voice and are at the edge of life or near extinct. Some of the reasons for that is most of the wildlife uh, on this planet has disappeared since the 70s. That's basically every 14 minutes, we lose another life form forever. Multi-species design is the kind of work that we are doing. So we think about uh, organisms and their needs. We look at their life cycles and then create an architecture to match that criterion. Here is some of the kind of the technology that we've been operating with, which is essentially something like uh, analog slash digital 3D printing with clay with impregnated seeds to make sure that uh, this material then takes on an, another sort of second life. Uh, other materials such as jute, acetobacter, chitosan, uh, different types of, of, of clays and and fabrication technologies, all of these things fit into our form making. Most of the forms are predicated on how different life forms need to breed or to eat or to propagate. Uh, this is an example of one of our multi-species facade systems. Here we're looking at different geometries inside a jute facade that welcome insects or amphibians or avian life to kind of occupy or co-opt or exist on the surface or inside the interstitial spaces of our buildings. We also do that with vegetation. This is a system we're looking at for a parking garage in Miami, which is also a 3D printed uh, clay system that would be impregnated with different seedlings. Other systems look at, uh, this one's about bees and facades along with the whole food web of different pollinators and other organisms that uh, live inside this particular facade. And it's not just honeybees because honeybees are doing fine. There are 3000 other species of bees that we need to consider habitat for. We also create, uh, I would say images that are propaganda based, but also help others vision and others meaning the public at large, what a socio-ecological city will look like. So here we see a riparian corridor going through the center of 42nd Street in New York City. We create a grand civic space that privileges the pedestrian to use it. We have trackless trains instead of noisy traffic, uh, vertical access wind turbines, photovoltaic skins, and then we got all kinds of vertical plant life, either for algae, for air quality, or for farming. And algae would be great for biomass production. And this becomes a point kind of a point of argumentation or for polemicizing what the future of our cities could be like. We also look at materials that are very old and are plant-based architecture, such as rice. The Great Wall of China was made, essentially most parts of it, with a rice and lime-based mortar that has lasted for thousands of years. We looked at rice as an architectural system, here from its microbial colonization to ways of puffing it, that use almost no carbon, to assembly and scaffolding systems, to create a, a, a voxel-like component that can make any geometry. Also here looking at bamboo as a way of creating tensile support. And then getting into ideas of rice where either we print them into exact precise shapes based on every single grain in perfect alignment, 
or a matrixy version where there is a brick and a mortar system that are combined. So the brick and the mortar are one. And I think that's what's very special about rice as a kind of architectural element. Then we looked at these different kinds of shapes and geometries and tectonic solutions. And here you can see the rice making almost any shape in a very pixelated manner. Uh, these are not Rice Krispies. These are all custom-made, in-house, super green and clean produced rice products that are essentially brick and mortar together. And then this project here is called the Anti-Extinction Library. It contains cryogenically preserved uh, uh, eggs that have been fertilized along with all of the biotope matter that a creature would need to survive. So this is a local creature that would be at the edge of extinction produced in this kind of um, public-like egg that is meant to slowly disappear. It's made out of uh, materials such as mycelium and paraffin waxes and, and lightweight cardboards. And essentially after seven years, it melts away. And seven years is to meet the climate uh, demand by the United Nation for 2030 and it releases an organism that is at the edge of life. It will not save that organism, but the goal here is to inform the public that every 14 minutes or so, depending on how you count all of life, creatures are disappearing and that there's something you can do about it. And perhaps one of those things is to vote differently for your um, leadership class. Other things we do is look at the metabolic streams of cities. So here, New York is essentially 36,000 tons of waste of trash, both inorganic and organic waste produced every single day in the city of New York. This is one hour's worth of waste greater than the volume of the Statue of Liberty. So we looked at solutions for what do you do with waste in cities? So here's a biotech version of that, which is a combination of mycelium or the root base of mushrooms, in this case, reishi combined with acetobacter or bacteria express, express cellulose uh, that you can get from something like kabucha tea. And we produced furniture from this. And this is now over 12 years old, maybe longer. We made uh, 20 something separate molds and made a chair that you could eat. This is my daughter in kindergarten at the time telling her uh, fellow classmates, you can eat the chair that daddy made. We then made full scale chairs that are triply curved in a, a much more complex geometry here with uh, plyboo slats, and that this is essentially uh, agricultural waste, such as cotton husks or wood chips or what have you. And then it's been acculturated with reishi. It grows into that shape in seven days. It is then petrified, has no allergens, has no smell. And this chair has been around for 10 years. We micromanufactured them. Other things we've done when it came to looking at waste in cities is this bit of science. Here, looking at mealworms. Mealworms tend to um, do a number of fascinating things. One is that they eat styrofoam. They completely absorb it through their body's enzymatic system and intestinal tracts, and they produce garden mulch with no chemical waste whatsoever. So these uh, mealworms became our client. We actually looked at the life cycle of them uh, all the way up to their darkling beetle stage which is great because a lot of other creatures eat those darkling beetles. We created a farming system to reproduce mealworms, to eat human garbage, and then become food for other animals to jumpstart biodiversity. We created this public architectural intervention uh, called the bioinformatic digester, where you can throw your styrofoam in the belly of this beast and watch those organisms eat all of the styrofoam. On top is a clock that shows different composition, decomposition rates for various types of materials from metals to styrofoam. Styrofoam takes anywhere from 500 to 1,000 years to decompose. So here is the uh, assembly. We were funded by the Bloomberg Foundation, and this was installed in Camden, New Jersey, which is outside of Philadelphia. It's a very indigent community with has a lot of um, empty junk space in the city. And this would be uh, one of the examples to help educate the community about what they can do with their waste. It's got a natural ventilation system through the top called the Oculus. And here's a project we've been working on also for some years, now going on to two decades, but it's looking at grafting woody plant matter, or essentially grafting trees to form uh, one, uh, one contiguous vascular system. 
So we have looked at the growth of different tap roots and accelerating root taps to make one long, essentially wet noodle that we could shape into any geometry. And then it would lignify and leaf propagation would begin again once it's exposed to light and soil. Uh, and then after years of doing that, we realized there's already in biomass farm production, woody plants grown at scale so that we can have buildings ready on day one that would be fully grown. So here, this is a willow farm. It's a dicot. It's graftable. It's already 25 feet in length. Here, it's being cut down and pelletized to be burned in wood stoves as a form of renewable en energy. But we were thinking of using it as a type of architecture. So here's a few examples of our scaffolding system with some dead willows, although we plan on keeping them alive, uh, but showing that we shape the geometry of those willows to follow a computer-driven mold. And that computer-driven mold could be almost any shape, although the tolerances are quite interesting the larger the plant gets and the, the difference of the, the girth of each one of the trunks of the plants, and would produce a project like this, which is called Home Alive. It is entirely made out of grafted willow clusters that are on a pre-made scaffolding. And this home is actually alive. These plants are in the ground. They continue to grow. They will continue to grow for hundreds of years. And the volume might change slightly. It will certainly get bigger, but it allows you to think about a truly living organic architecture, not a metaphor or not mimicry of nature, but actual living architecture. So we had planned to produce this particular house, living house uh, in upstate New York on a horse farm. The main modules, such as the toilets and the kitchen, they will not be living elements. We're looking into materials that are as green as possible and produce zero carbon, but it, we cannot grow, as far as I know right now, things like um, toilets or uh, kitchen sinks. So you would have a core that would be this this, the kind of the central needs of the house, and then the volumes would be treated in this way. It's also a multi-species configuration. So the paneling in between the, these grafted root structures uh, would be designed for all other kind, kinds of life. So it, the idea is to help jumpstart biodiversity in this particular location. We welcome all kinds of creatures on the outside, from bats to squirrels to lizards to bugs, not on the inside, but on the outside, it is a place for them to thrive, prosper, and take part in their different food webs. You can see that these panels get inserted into the scaffolding, and the scaffolding is filled up with the willow clusters, which are then grafted and watered. And after about a year or so, we can remove the scaffolding. The multi-species panels stay in place, and you have a living structure with a wall system that is designed for other creatures. And that is the, the uh, architectural concept for this particular living home. Uh, we are call, calling it the cultivated hut. It is an engineered living material house with a multi-species facade system. I think it's a play on the primitive hut, uh, for those of you who are familiar with that as a theory, but it is uh, using living elements to make an architecture, but it's not throwing out the last 100 years of industrial design and fabrication technology. So we're using that to help shape and grow those things into precise geometries. These are different views of the cultivated hut in situ, uh, showing, uh, showing it as a pavilion for the moment until we can get it to be a full-scale house. But this was a project that Terraform had done uh, with itself and funded by a few uh, private uh, patrons. Uh, you can see another view of it here where the home is almost indistinguishable from the landscape. Home and landscape essentially become one, and that is the goal. These are some bioswales, and the willows require a lot of water, and that's necessary for them to thrive for the first few years. Uh, and you can see that this is essentially very much a part of nature. And then, uh, you know, just a few last projects I want to show. This was another client of ours. This is a cricket, and this was a guy for eating. And essentially, we're looking at alternative forms of food. Instead of cows, pigs, chicken, and lamb, uh, Europe and the United States needs to think about eating insect-based protein. Why? Well, it's around 300 times less greenhouse gas emissions, for one, versus something like cattle farming. 
And two, it's around 2000 gallons less water than the same gram of protein you get from a cow. So this is comparing two areas of land use, the exact same size, one in urban condition, one in rural. The pink areas are for farming uh, crickets to get cricket powder, which is a great alternate form of protein. And you actually make the same amount, if not more, but have all those other benefits when it comes to the environment. So we used a technology called architecture, space, light, air, gravity. We design shelters and farms. Here is the cricket shelter and farm is what it's called for uh, these sentient beings. They live very happy lives, get big and fat, have lots of sex. And then when they die naturally, they are harvested, ground into a flower and made into bagels, bonbons, pasta, what have you. Some of the best pasta I've ever had came from cricket flour. We're working with Michelin rated chefs to uh, create, to feed them lime rinds and orange peels and apple cores to change their flavor uh, and their gut metabolism to make them as juicy as possible once they get milled into a uh, usable food product. And here it is in another view, the horns on the top actually accentuate the sound of cricket chirping. So we get vibrating columns of air that are naturally ventilated through the entire structure and then on the top, uh, you can hear the sound of the chirping, which means they're not worried about survival. They're looking to propagate their species and move throughout the entire shelter. This is the cricket sex pod. Essentially, it's an area for the males and females to come together and encourage them to reproduce. Uh, this is another view of the cricket shelter and farm system. Also looking at uh, green balls instead of green walls. These are farm systems that could be almost any size. We've productized them to be around 18 feet, but you could have them as small as something like four or five feet. You can occupy the inside as a part couch or cabin, but you would have them in an urban area, such as on your rooftop or on a balcony or inside an apartment, and you'd grow your food. High yield crops, not things like corn and wheat, which you can get from any place in Ohio, where have you but things like arugula, spirulina, wheatgrass, we even do cellular agronomy. Those are the test tubes there. You get fresh flavors that would enhance your food plate. And there's an app that tells you when they're ready. We've got nine columns of drip irrigation that trickle into these double skin wick fed pots and a cistern at the base. You rotate it to get sunlight. There's also uh, grow lights embedded at the base. So we keep it well lit and allow the food to prosper. And you go from uh, uh, pasture to plate rather quickly. And finally, the, the last project we're looking at is saving uh, these butterflies from extinction. These are painted ladies. They're not the ones that are going extinct, but we're looking at monarchs. So we design systems to think about how monarch butterflies, which are now listed as endangered, they weren't when we started the project. They were an at-risk species, according to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We looked at the interstitial space in double skin facades here in a building proposed for uh, Lolita in New York City. Also in the atrium and an education center and pollinated, pollinator garden on the roof. And it looked at the entire life cycle of monarchs, what their needs are, and gives them a chance to jumpstart and rewild their population in New York. They are native to New York, these beautiful orange and black butterflies. We had large scale screens on the exterior of the building so you could see the drama of these very small creatures from far away. And the entire facade is a vertical meadow designed to keep these butterflies happy. We also were commissioned for the American Museum of Natural History where we created a feeder system for butterflies to eat fresh fruits. Uh, the feeder system previously was Gatorade in a Petri dish. So we did a lot better focusing, especially with kids on areas of interest so they can see different species of butterflies. We also worked with BASF, uh, one of the largest chemical companies, if not the largest on earth, to make the greenest concrete called Green Sense as a structural system that was, almost, that was also fireproof for monarch butterflies. We looked at different geometries for butterflies to interface with the building and produce this vertical meadow inside a double skin facade. This is our uh, fully built two ton engineered uh, experimental facade that was in the Smithsonian at the Cooper Hewitt with designed as a sanctuary for monarch butterflies and other forms of life. 
when you look out the window of this facade, you'd see this incredible garden teeming with life and butterflies. They're in a semi-porous membrane, so they're not kept in there like a cage, but they can move in and out of it in certain areas. And they're given a chance to jumpstart their population and their lives again. And this is actual monarchs that we kept in there for a day, although the museum is not a zoo and is not allowed to keep live creatures of any sort. Anyway, that's some of the work that we're doing at Terraform One. I look forward to seeing many of you in person uh, there at uh, the Institute with Norman Foster and come and check out our work at terraform.org. Thank you very much. And I'm sure I'll be able to uh, answer some questions uh, in the future, but for now, uh, that's where we're at. Again, my name is Dr. Mitchell Joachim. See you. Thank you.